This is the Linux Action Show Unplugged, Episode 1 for August 12th, 2013. everyone, welcome to the Linux Action Show Unplugged. It's our first episode, and that's exciting, and we're doing it on a Monday afternoon. My name is Chris. My and name joined is Matt. Us, Matt. Hey, Matt. Hey there. Sorry, I didn't mean to step on you. No, that's okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So I, uh, one thing that uh, I'm kind of looking forward to, because we never really get a chance to do it in the big show, is bring on some folks and chat with them live during the show. And we have a hangout set up, and we'll see how it works out. I'm a little concerned. We've got audio troubles, but I think it's yeah, going to be good. good. Getting a little funky. It's it's learning, you know, getting used to the new timing, getting used to the whole thing. It's uh, you know, it's definitely Google Plus is being a little janky. I think what we've discovered is that the future does not lie in Hangouts for this show. But already at launch, we know it's probably we need to set up a Mumble server or something. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. And, and then we'll get like uh, people hanging out in there, and we can bring them into like rooms that are designed just for the show, and then we can kick people out when they're jerks. <laughs> I like that idea. We, yeah. we already had like a we had, we've, in just in the short time we've been on Hangouts, we've had Windows 8 users stop by. That was almost offensive, but I mean we were accept, we were accepting of their choices, and we had people that didn't speak English stop by, didn't use no, Linux stop by. Yeah, so Hangouts so far were a little hit and miss, but we'll bring the we'll bring in the panel that we have assembled later in the show as we get going. Uh, but first, I want to just take a minute and uh, talk about the new show. We don't plan to do this too often, but it's kind of an opportunity to talk about ourselves a little bit. Matt and I were uh, kind of brainstorming on a couple of problems that the Linux Action Show has faced. And one has been uh, that we just have this torrential amount of feedback that we generate every single week from every single show. Uh, and ideas sometimes on how to do something differently than how we talked about it in the show. Sometimes it's, it's hey, did you actually know that maybe that's not the best way to do it? Or anything like that, right? Exactly. And trying to find a way to present that in a way that wasn't going to just absolutely become a time suck. <laughs> right. Yeah, because it would drag down the whole show. Exactly. And I had I had threatened for like a long time. I was like, one of these days, Matt, I'm going to make a feedback show and we're also going to talk about his feedback. Well, that's kind of what we're doing, although that's not the show in, in, in its entirety. That's only going to be a component of this show. Uh, you know, I mean, the feedback, I think, is going to generate a lot of good discussion and a lot of ideas. But I'm hoping uh, that this show is um, even more of an opportunity to kind of get down into... Uh, some episodes I want to just like totally just dig into a topic and we're just going to only talk about really just that. And, you know, maybe we'll just spend an hour discussing something, just really go deep. Sometimes I want to I want to just be all over the board and just talk about uh, topics that have come up throughout the week, things that people want to bring up, uh, you know, do panel discussions, mm-hmm. kind of like we're going to try in this episode and see what I'm, works. I'm pretty excited about the prospect of it. I think it's going to be interesting to see how this comes to fruition, which direction we end up taking it, and really where the uh, chat room guides us to. Yeah, and, and and what from this will kind of surface up into the big show and make mm-hmm. that an even better show. And right. uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. But uh, I wanted to start, I thought, with uh, the most classiest way, um, <laughs> and that would be me complaining. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Matt? <laughs> always, always a classy, a classy approach. Right. Like whenever you want to impress people with the new show, the first thing you want to do is try to offend a good subset of your potential listeners. <laughs> I, that's <laughs> Podcaster 101. Everybody knows that. I don't know why more oh, shows yeah. don't do this. Uh, it was actually, and I, I, I can't, I can't bear all the blame. I have to put some of the blame on James zero six one zero in our uh, subreddit. He he wrote and he got me thinking. He said, "Forget the Arch Challenge." I'm, I'm doing the KDE challenge. And he says, why am I doing this? Well, back in 2006-ish, I started to debate, or I'm sorry, dabble around with Linux when I was like a kid in a sweatshop. It was, wow. I hit a roadblock when I tried KDE. I hated it back then. It was slow. It, it was, was bad. Buggy. It was, it was bad. old. I stayed away ever since. Yesterday, he says, I started to get those itchy Linuxy feet where I couldn't stay still on what I was using. I've been there. I've seen that myself. Instead of distro hopping i thought maybe i would try desktop hopping i gave kde another go to force myself to stay with it for at least a month here's what i found so far the bad points shit default settings can be fixed with some tweaks and i uh matt you know Mm -hmm. after the after we went off air two weeks ago i just kind of leaned over with you and i said i am so freaking tired of these ass backwards settings in kde every (laughs) single default i have to change didn't i say that after the show you almost wonder if the kde devs are trolling users right i mean who in their right mind would make these settings legit i know it doesn't work i so uh but that said that said what you know they let you change them right 
Uh-huh. And boy, can you change them in any way you want. Uh, and they are fairly straightforward to set up. Then he goes on to say, uh, way too many <laughs> customization options, which kind of seems like the two might be related. If I was jumping into Linux for the first time, uh, this would make me jump straight back to Windows. But here's some good points. KWIN is a really good window manager. True. Yeah, I, I really agree with him there. And he said it can look stunning with a lot of work once you get it set up. He says, am I going to stick with KD? I don't know. I'll let you know in four weeks. Well, so here's the thing. I, you know, KDE, when you massage the hell out of it, and I'm talking about deep tissue, hot rocks, you know, th- <laughs> hell, throwing hot rocks at it. I mean, you basically got to stone the damn thing to make it work right. And even when you get it there, then the sound server decides, you know what? Oh, hey, you're using Pulse and you're using that phone on oh, thing. Man. So we're going to really mix it up for you. Yeah. That's where it kills me yeah. every time. I mean, people who were watching the uh, live stream of Last Unplugged know that we spent about 15 minutes just monkeying around with audio settings trying to get it to work right um like what yeah 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 there there so here's what i have here's what i have kind of come to with kde so uh last week after the linux action show i got back into my home office where i edit and once again my audio didn't work and i said screw it i restarted i logged into gnome and i thought for myself for about three days Man, this is so nice. It's like I'm in the <laughs> right? Zen garden. I wanted to go meditate on a rock, Matt. I tell you, it was beautiful. <laughs> like a Cardassian on a hot stone. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm telling you, man. Yeah, man, those Cardassians give some damn good uh, hot stone massages. That's right. Uh, especially when, and never mind. Uh, anyway, so <laughs> I, I, I loved it. And then I quickly realized that KDE, while it has its lumps, is 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 in my opinion, when you look back over the last five years of Linux desktops, is the one that's going in the right direction by the longest shot. And from a from a technology standpoint, like Qt, but also from like um, you know an integration standpoint between all the applications. Like I just you know learned the other day, I can right click on the volume control and switch which device a program goes to right within the uh-huh. mixer. Uh, there's like you, you can you can middle click on the maximize button and it horizontally maximizes uh, or vertically. Um, you know this, these there's a lot of little things in here that as a power user. Are uh, they release dopamine in the back of my monkey brain when I I'm like, oh, someone thought of me, someone thought of me. Oh man, that has bugged me for so long. I constantly get that sensation when I'm using KDE. I found it to be a mixed bag. I wouldn't go quite that far, but I would say that I find it aesthetically pleasing. I love that under Arch and or and or Majero, when you run it, um, you don't have that weird overheating problem with the uh, notebooks. Um, that's one thing, at least with my netbook specifically. You know, I found the desktop environments apparently matter. Uh, it's the weirdest thing. I don't know why. <laughs> KD runs cool as ice. XFCE runs like crap. Now, how can that be though? Because like Kwin has compositing, so it's only- using. Yeah, but it's the only differential. And then I said, okay, on a on a just a total crack pipe thing, I went and go, searched it just to see if I'm nuts. No, other people have experienced this. Maybe so it's like maybe whoa, XFCE what's going on? Lo, lo, is um, using the CPU more for rendering, whereas uh, it must K-Win be. Is but using then the I GPU. go to but then when I look at my t- you know I, I run a top or anything else, and it's like there's nothing weird going on. It just runs hot. It just runs hot. It's like there's nothing I can really identify. If I look at their logs. I can't figure it out. So it's the craziest thing. And you've noticed that you've noticed a big enough difference on. Uh, oh, I, on well, I'm running KD right now. And besides the fact that the sound server decided to play musical, let's make things disappear. Um, you know, <laughs> other than that, it runs really ice cold. I yeah. mean, like I could put, I could literally cool off my soda right now by putting it on top of the computer. Huh. I actually have had the opposite <laughs> experience to some degree, and I think really, I think it's because um, mm-hmm. I'm just my GPU is getting hit a little more with KWIN, mm-hmm. but I don't know. I was, so you know, I ended up logging out of GNOME about three days three days after the experiment started. Went back onto KDE, dropped the whole Unity setup. Said, "Nah, you mm-hmm. know what? I'm just going to go taskbar on the bottom, standard setup with Conky. I, you know, I've got mm-hmm. that going now, and I'm just trying. to, I figure if I just stick with the audio problems long enough, I'll either wait out the problems with KDE and they'll just get it fixed, or right. I'll become so adept at the ju- at the juggle, which I am starting to do now. Like, I'm starting to be able to juggle, like, while I'm on air, like, oh, I'll get change this audio interface. Oh, unplug this USB <laughs> interface, plug it in. You know, I'm starting to get the juggle down, and uh, so maybe I'll just cope with it that way. Uh, but I do, th- I think there's also this concept um, that um, James was touching on, and maybe it's more, like, more possible with Arch. But I am now kind of like, maybe I'm just going to hang out on Arch for a really long time. And whenever I feel like I, I'm getting that itch, I'll just install another desktop. That's the nice thing, right? Because it's so easy to do. Just boom, done. Yeah. I wonder I if know. that, the only thing is, is we're going to see, like I've got elementary OS. I loaded it up uh, this morning on a, on an external USB hard drive, little USB drive that I'll be running 10,000 RPM USB 3 hard drive. 
that I'll be running it on for the week so we can talk about it on Sunday on the Linux Action Show. And um, I'll tell you, I'm going to save it for the review, but there's a couple aspects of a simple UI that I feel like make me a more productive user. True. And, and, and I know we've differed greatly on XFCE to where I'm, I'm a fan of it, to where basically you're saying if I can't run a modern desktop, I'm not going to run that, that hardware. I'm just not going to do it. And I've always taken the prospect of I'll run that lower end desktop and stuff like that. So when I look at things like AKD, I look at elementary, I look at all these things and they're, and they're pretty and all that. But for me, it just really depends on the hardware I'm going to run it on. Yeah. So I don't know. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I hear you. So it's something I've, mm. I've kind of continued to, uh, evolve my stance on because I've, I've flip-flopped around a lot but i think um like it all really kind of kicked off and started for me when when unity kind of started to jump the shark i i mm-hmm. would i actually think potentially my perfect desktop maybe was ubuntu 1304 right maybe yeah. or maybe like yeah. but but the problem there is like Unity, I wish I could take that whole desktop experience and move it to Arch. Just I know you can install Unity on Arch, but I just wish I could just just lift all that top layer off and lay it down on top of the Arch underlayer. Um because that would be nice. Yeah, that, that UI to me was very, very efficient. It was very fast. I don't know. Yeah, I honestly I just don't have a I don't have a lot of love or hate for Unity because I mean I'm actually running uh, Skype right now on a Unity desktop on a, on a Ubuntu box and honestly I just it's come to a point yeah. where 1304 I don't care. Yeah. I if, if it slows down worse, I probably will stick to this yeah. for quite a while. I mean, you'll see. If you upgrade yeah. to 1310, you'll see what I'm talking about. Oh, that's un- that's so unfortunate. What a dumb thing to do. And, you know, the other thing too is like with Arch is, uh, and with all the other distributions too, they're kind of, now that Canonical is going off on their own path, I, I don't feel like I'm as connected to what the community is working on on that desktop. So it's got a lot exactly. going for it there. Exactly. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot, a lot of going against there. it. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of drama. Exactly. And I just don't care for the drama. Huh. Yeah. So uh, there you go. I switched back. I'm, I'm back. I'm living on KD. And Matt, you are too. It's interesting. You're kind of flipping a little bit too. Well, see, and I run all kinds of stuff. It's, it's like, to kind of give you a heads up of the setup, I'm running right at this very moment. Behind me is my Manjaro slash Arch setup. You know, usually I run Manjaro primarily. Uh, that's you know, and that's running XFC happily on a on a desktop. In front of me now, because I've turned to my other desks, I basically have the Ubuntu setup where I've got the Skype thing going on right now. And then on a netbook, I actually have, uh, I believe it's actually Arch with KDE. Pretty so sure. yeah. I think we are in a position <laughs> right now where I, what we're not talking about. I don't know. Maybe this is my impression, but the elephant to me in the room seems like. Nobody's 100% happy with any Linux desktop anymore. No. And we're all trying different things out. And nothing's really quite sticking. And I feel like um, the one the KDE that has the most potential, even still, there's some distros out there that are giving a great shot and really make a great looking KDE desktop. But still, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. nothing is just out. Of, like, why isn't somebody going all elementary OS with QT and KDE? Like, why exactly. isn't that happening? Why aren't we getting the, the most you know, refined, artisanal KDE desktop that could sort of shake this whole this whole situation up a little bit and slap people in the face and look what you can do with KDE. Why aren't we seeing this? Why are we only seeing Cinnamon and Mate yep. and the, the elementary OS desktop environment? Why are we seeing all of this stuff and we're not seeing anybody go after... QT, KDE, and let's just make it great. Let's bring it down. Let's whittle it down sure. to the finest elements. And instead, what we, so, and so what we see, what you and I see, we see all of our audience members out there that are constantly saying, well, I'm trying this. Oh, I don't like this. Oh, I moved to this. We're always constantly moving around. Some of that's because we're geeks, but I think a lot of it is because most of the time it's not good enough. Like I'll give you an example. Dolphin, amazing okay. file manager, super fast, flies through my directories, mm-hmm. can't play video files off of Samba Share. <laughs> right. So yeah, I don't, like file, I don't like file handling and KDE at all. It's just obnoxious. Even right clicking makes me cringe. Uh, it's just I don't know what it is, but the way they do things is so ass backwards. Um, yeah, and and then of course inside of Dolphin's another great example of it. My biggest gripe, I can make KDE work. Fine. If even if I could, I can handle all the other crap. If they just did one thing and just dealt with allowing pulse audio <laughs> and the, the that they could, if they could make yeah. that work properly. I would be fine with it. And I probably am going to make this a project now because I want to make this work. Because I can't really, you know, gnome just makes me want to throw up. I just can't. I can't do it. I try to just. Uh, it just yeah, isn't really for me. Know, we Unity, get notes. Yeah. We get notes from people that say that you know gnome works great for them, and it was working really good for me for a long time. But I just get really twitchy about uh, that much functionality being driven by plugins. And um, I'll tell you, 
uh, I think it was right before a show started or during mm-hmm. a show. I can't remember. I might have actually happened during a show. Um, I went to click on my... This is actually why I stopped... One of the reasons I stopped using GNOME again. I went to click on my volume applet in my menu bar and I accidentally clicked on the imager um, oh, extension, no. which had been, up until that point, a great extension where I, I click on imager, then I draw a box on my screen. Whatever I draw, it takes a snapshot of and immediately uploads it to imager and then puts the uh, URL on my clipboard, Right. Super right. handy, like, hey, like when I'm chatting in the IRC, I'm like, hey, check out this screenshot. And I just, you know, <laughs> click, drag, boom, done. Accidentally click the imager extension in my menu bar. Whole GNOME session totally freaks the F out. Not just like the normal GNOME where like things close and then like zooms uh-huh. back in, but like pair, like freaking like epileptic shock flashing on my screen. Flash, 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 like just nonstop. Couldn't go to the text terminal. Everything was all screwed up. <laughs> and I had to hard reboot the machine because I clicked the imager extension. Oh my god! See, that's what I'm talking about. That's why I can't. I can't deal with GNOME, even with all Unity's flaws. Just, you know, although the audio is a big one, but the rest of them, for me, they're paper cuts. They're minor. They're just not a big deal. The Sky okay, Shaper the, thinks I'm know. bashing that GNOME three because of a plugin, but I, d- Matt, am I wrong or don't you think the desktop environment should be designed to protect you from a plugin crash like that? Well, the whole the, here's the problem with GNOME. The, in my my experience anyway with GNOME is that as you pointed out, everything's based around extensions and all these plugins and stuff. So it's a little bit like saying, okay, I'm going to take a green Pinto and I'm going to drop a brand new engine in it. Then I'm going to put some electric windows. I'm going to get a new sound system. I'm going to do all this other stuff, and it's all going to coordinate through one flux capacitor. And oh, you know, now, okay, it, wait a minute. Now that sounds kind of cool, to be honest. With yeah, you. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, but yeah, and then your and then let's say your uh, your sound system goes kaplooey on you, and because it's all wired through the same doohickey. Everything in the car goes to crap. Well, that's essentially what's happening in GNOME. Because of one stupid plug-in, something can create that kind of headache. Yeah, shouldn't happen. That's a real problem. Now, with KDE, on the other hand, it's different because of the fact that you are looking at, in my opinion anyway, you know, these are they're minor issues. I, I, again, excluding audio because that's not minor. But as far as, like, the way it behaves and stuff like that, it's annoying, but it's not taking a crap out on me every time I click something. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't like the usability point of it so much. Eh, but, you know, I can make it work. KDE so. seems to me no more esoteric than learning the ins and outs uh, of Windows or, or right. you know, another complex operating. It's Windows Seven to me, really. I mean, it re- it's about it's kind of a meh kind of experience. It's not bad. It's just not great. Well, why don't we before we move off this topic, try yeah. bringing in the Hangout and uh, see Hangout guys. Somebody, uh, somebody there, say something. Mr. Bacon, there, you got a shirt on. It says Bacon, and you were drinking a beer. I yeah, I like that. That's a nice shirt, dude. That's a great. That's a nice looking beer too. Now, is your mic on? Oh, hold on. He's gonna unmute. Hi there. All right, no, I still don't hear you. I still don't hear you. But I like I like your shirt still. And he's got a whiteboard behind him too, Matt. I mean, this guy's cool. Yeah, he's set up. He's, and he's prepared. He's got a pretty swank lamp too. And I don't even know why I haven't mentioned this. Dude has a huge ass beard. That's a great looking beard, man. I love that beard. Nice. There you go. Welcome to the show. Uh oh, well, I had you for a second. Well, I'll, I'll open this up to the general panel. So anybody on the hangout who has a working mic. Uh, what are your thoughts on, is the Linux desktop just not yet there, or are Matt and I just spinning our wheels, and we just need to settle down and learn to love what we got? Anybody on there? I, well, I'm, I think the point of, sorry to interrupt. No, I go ahead, just say your name. Of Josh Strobel uh, from, from IRC. I think the point of the Linux desktop is you don't have to settle on just one thing. You could jump around. That's the beauty of it. You're not stuck with one interface. So I don't really have an issue with people jumping from KDE to GNOME to Unity to LXD to Clyde to Enlightenment and so on and so forth. Because it, it's about having that freedom, having that choice. So I, that's the beauty of, beauty of Linux. You can always move around. Any other? Anybody sure. else want to chime in? Well, uh, I can say that I'm uh, one of the few Unity lovers. I've tried a number of the different desktops, but... Uh, this Unity satisfies me, does exactly what I want to do, so I'm happy with Unity. Now, which version of Ubuntu are you on? 12.04 LTS. And you just kind of plan to hang out there for a while? Absolutely. I like yeah. to get one set up that'll yeah. do what I want to do and 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 leave it there do you because have, I, I use it. <laughs> do you have any concerns about some of the desktop software you use kind of falling behind in, ter- in versions? Or has that not been a problem in your experience? No, it's not been a problem for me. Yeah. I think that if, if I, you know, I wonder too, if, if I was kind of more in a traditional sort of work environment or office environment, I think I would probably just run an LTS or, uh-huh. or, or something like that. But because I'm kind of in the position where I always kind of want fresh, hot, hot off the presses code, you know, it kind of pushes me in a different direction myself. 
Well, and I can understand his perspective on that because if you think about it, he has something that works well. He has the applications he enjoys to using. It's no muss, no fuss. He knows he boots it up. It's going to start. It's going to run. His apps are going to work as he expects. I can definitely see the uh, benefit of that. Yeah. Now, Dan, were you going to say something? Yeah, I'm sorry. I just wanted to put a little uh, aspect on this. I mean, what was the question? Is it ready for full-on mainstream or... What well, you, no, not even is. that. Because I, I think what we're running into is even as non-mainstream users, it still seems to have it still seems to fall short as a complete inclusive solution. Like you have you, I, I constantly am seeing threads from people trying GNOME for a few weeks, trying KDE, then going to XFCE, then going to a tiling window manager. And I think to me that seems to that seems to to, to suggest that none of these desktops are fully baked. That they're not they're not solving a hundred percent of the problems for everybody. Maybe not even. 70% of the problems. And I think instead of just admitting that as Linux users, we kind of gloss over it and say, well, we have choice. Mm. Yeah, we do, but um, the downside to that is, you're right, we don't have an all-in-one-world solution. Unity is probably one of the closer ones to that, but everybody, let's say uh, some people, like to look down on the Ubuntu users. Mm -hmm. um, but if it works for you, like, uh, I forgot his name, but the older gentleman there, great. If it works for you, there's no reason you shouldn't use it. If it's happy, True. it makes you happy, and it works. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But it, we knew, we do need a, a slim, fast desktop environment that does have everything without having to make compromises. And I think that's what we are lacking. And so in your opinion, KDE or GNOME or any of those haven't solved that for you? Well, I felt it with, Kate, with uh, GNOME 2 a um, long time ago. Yeah. I, I thought I had everything, but I was really, yeah. really new that. But I, I didn't. I wasn't missing anything, but with KDE, I kept having to think, wow, crap, I'm missing out. So I went back over and over again. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. All right, anybody else I on the hangout? Yeah, go ahead. Um, me, Michael? Yeah, Michael? Oh, you're kind of cutting out, Michael. Can you hear me? Yeah, a little bit. Go ahead and try. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I've been using Mate and Simon a lot the last year. I think both of them have been... I've, I've, been, I've been very happy with both of them. I've been using it on, uh, on Mint and on Arch. Mate, huh? All right, you're breaking off. I'm going to cut you off there, but Mate, yeah. that's interesting. That's all right. I didn't expect that. I didn't see that coming. I didn't see Mate coming, but I'll, I'll be honest, I, I don't... Uh well, and I can, I and I understand the, you know, I actually was a big uh, GNOME 2 fan, so I understand the the desire to use Mate from the standpoint of, you know what you're getting, you know where everything's at, you've got your little applets, I mean, everything's kind of predictable, you know exactly what you're going to get, and it, it's, you know, it's a pleasant enough interface for someone that just wants functionality, they're not looking for a lot of eye candy, um, you know, and I think that... I think that certainly presents an interesting point. One thing that struck me, though, as everyone was talking, that I realized that Windows users and OS X users, they may have an all-in-one solution. But what's interesting, if they hate something about their desktop environment, that's too bad. Yeah. With us. They become Linux users. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's totally right. That's yeah, exactly that, it. Yeah. And, and so for us, we are spoiled in that we have something to complain about because we have that option. And I, I guess so. I, and I, and you know. I do agree with you, and I have made that argument myself. But like I said... Mm -hmm. I just don't want that to be sort of an excuse to cover up the fact that nothing's all that great. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, KDE might have sound issues and GNOME has extension crashing problems and XFCE right. might feel like it's from the 90s and Unity is controlled by an egomaniac, but at least you have choice. <laughs> but here's, but here's, the, here's the point that you may, may have over skipped on a little bit. Here. All right. Think of it this way. Think of it this way. So we know that GNOME and KDE and even some of the lighter weight desktops, they're not going to change unless they want to. That's just reality. Uh, Unity, same thing. They're going to do what the, whatever the hell they please. But some of these other guys, uh, Cinema, uh, I think it was uh, elementary OS and all this kind of doing their own thing with desktop stuff. I think that's where we're going we're gonna to begin seeing more stuff develop yeah. out of projects like that. Right. And that's probably where the solution is going to come from. Isn't it Way funny, more, though? Because those you know. guys some get some of the biggest pushback because elementary gets, oh, it's a Mac clone, and Cinnamon gets, oh, what's the point? You're, you're just wasting effort and resources. But in reality, maybe they're going to shake things up the most. They're, some, they're doing some of the most interesting differentiation out of all of them. IBM once said there was absolutely no money in software. They were wrong. I think the people that are saying that the you know the, all this oh this you don't need to make it look like this or make it look like that are also wrong. I think that history will show us that. I think over time we will actually see that happen. And yeah, the, they can maybe. complain all they want. Yeah, you know, that's yeah. Their business. It's it is a long game, right? And yeah, of course is. we are the uh, we are the uh, sports commentators that are here watching the game mm -hmm. as it unfolds. Uh, but uh, it is it is a long game. All right. So. Um, 
they uh, this is uh, sounds like you're trying to type, so we muted your mic. Gosh, Google Google Plus is really something. How about our Google? Look at that. Look at Google. <laughs> like, hey, no, hey, hey, jackass, quit typing. It says, I'm sorry. No I'm sorry. Kidding. No All kidding. right. Well, before we move to uh, the next kind of quasi topic, we don't have real topics. We do have a, a couple <laughs> of real sponsors that I wanted to thank. Uh, the first one, this one, I I, uh, I am so thrilled because I know someone out in our audience is going to have a much better better day after they hear about Unity Sync from Directory Wizards. And Unity Sync, it's version 2.0 came out uh, towards the end of August, runs on Linux, and it will allow you to move information between multiple types of directories. So you think of like maybe with Unity Sync, you could synchronize count information between different uh, LDAP directories you might have in your network. Oh, there goes my mm-hmm. bottle cap. Or uh, maybe you might have... Uh, you might have something like an HR application that stores something in some crappy Microsoft SQL database, and you want to sync that out to your uh, to MySQL or to an LDAP da- uh, directory, so that way when HR updates a phone number, that S moves over to that directory you have in in for IT, so that way everybody's phone numbers in the, on the company internet automatically get updated. All these kinds of little things where you have data that exists in all these different directories, but nothing's been intelligent enough to move them all together. Well, on top of that, not only is Unity Sync built to do that, but it also can do things like templates. So you can say when somebody, when a data, with da- when data gets entered into a field, doesn't match this, don't sync that, or only sync oh, these cool. attributes of the directory. Don't sync the entire directory. Don't sync the entire tree. Just go down the tree into this sp- particular area and grab just those attributes. This is solving that age-old IT problem. And man, oh man, did I run into this stuff, especially when I had clients who merged companies, so they'd uh-huh. have separate active directories or separate LDAP directories, and they wanted to keep them separate for a while, but then they wanted to have some accounts, like the admin account <laughs> and the CEO account, they want to sync those between the direct. Can you just sync those for me real quick? Thanks. Yeah, Unity Sync takes care of that. Listen, if you go over to derwiz.com, click on the download link, put in the code Linux, you'll get an extended 30-day trial and your first year of maintenance for frizzles. Yeah, that's right, for frizzles. I said it. I said it. So go to <laughs> derwiz.com. And while you're over there and you're looking at Unity Sync, check out some of their customers. They have it linked on the left hand side of the page. And customers include things like, oh, the Air Force Command to Control Information Systems of Canada. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Some big uh, names. Oh, uh, it go, the list goes on and on. Fiserv is in here. Um, the uh, the DOA, the DIA, the DC court, the DC council, um, the uh, the uh, there was one that was yeah. Pentagon Telecommunications Center is in here. Omnicom is in here. Wow. Uh, the U.S. Episode. Army Force Com is in here. Uh, U.S. Marine Corps is in here. U.S. Special Operations Command is in here. We're talking enterprise grade, and it's under five megabytes. And you can get it downloaded and loaded on your Linux box in no time, and then manage it with a super easy to use web front end. Gotta love that. Go to derwiz.com, click on Unity Sync, and put in the code Linux to grab the demo and enjoy the magic. Thanks to uh, Unity Sync for sponsoring Last Unplugged. That's awesome. Thanks, guys. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, they heard about that. I'm like, dude, we want to be on that. We want to be on that. That's cool. I got one little tip that I mentioned just briefly today on Coder Radio uh, before we move on, and I, that is, uh, I, I didn't talk about it on last, but I had an, I had a Nexus 7. I think I've mentioned that on the show. Mm-hmm. In fact, I loaded Ubuntu on, Touch on there one time. Well, so the the Nexus 7 is plagued by a little bug that nobody, no Google advocate ever talks about. And if this happened to the iPad, people would be up in arms about it. And it's an interesting, it's, it, it is an interesting example of how the tech press doesn't ride Google the way they should for some of this stuff. So, turns out, Nexus 7, you let it die all the way, can't charge it. You drain the battery all the way, not going to charge. That's a problem. Yeah, that's yeah. not even cool. Yeah, people drain their tablets, Matt. That happens. Oh, man. Right. Yeah, I mean, who doesn't? I mean, that's the whole point. And you can't recover from that? That's, Especially that when mean, you have two geez. kids, right? So the charger is initiated by software. So the charging oh. process doesn't start until you boot into Android, and Android says, yeah, start charging that battery for me. Well, if the battery doesn't, if the battery doesn't have enough charge, what happens is you boot in, even if it's plugged in, you boot into Android. Immediately, Android says, oh, dude, oh, dude, you got 0% battery. Better reboot. <laughs> So it goes into a shutdown process. Uh, that shutdown process has some sort of video card driver crash, and then you get static snow on the screen like you got on your old TV, and then it shuts off, and then it boots again, and it does it all over again, and it just loops and loops until the battery is so dead you can't even get it to power on. So I let my I was kind of mad at it, so I let it sit for a little while. I found out if it's really, really, really dead, what you have to do is grab the original Asus power brick and the original Asus USB power cord, plug those in, let it sit for like an hour. It won't turn on, it won't respond to your power button, so don't even press it. Just let it sit for like an hour, okay? Uh-huh. Then, now this is really funny, after, the, after you let it sit for an hour, you pull the power cord, 
count for 10 seconds, then plug the power cord back in, okay? okay. After you've plugged the power cord back in, hold down the power button and the, <laughs> let's see, let's see, I think it's the down arrow, the down volume oh area, and press, yeah. Hold that until you start to see the bootloader come up. Then when the bootloader comes up, choose power off, and then it will charge while powered off. That is the stupidest design I've ever heard. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I mean, that is just crazy stupid. But I was able to rescue my Nexus 7 and get uh, well, 4.3. Well, that's good. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, after an encyclopedia of reading, you were able to recover something that should have been yeah. able. I mean, that's, oh my God. I will link to the Google article in the show notes uh, if you guys uh, run it. I, I got to imagine, I mean, tablets die and kids leave them playing video games. I mean, I'm sure some right. angry birds were just chewing through the battery for a while. Uh, so I I, cl- I fixed that up and then I uh, I uh, wiped it with four and you know four three stock and then I gave that to my grandpa for his 80th birthday. <laughs> so now I am <laughs> Nexus awesome. free. I, I was honestly I think part of the reason was because this happened to me twice. The first time I was able to get into the bootloader myself, but the the second time, this letting it charge for an hour and then unplugging it for ten seconds and then plugging it back in. Mm-hmm. That was the secret magic to actually get it to work this last time. And I was just so frustrated with it. And my you know I figured my grandpa. He's been wanting to play with Android. He's 80 years old. Mm-hmm. You got an 80-year-old man saying, I'd like to play with Android 4.3. How do you say no to that? Oh, totally. And what a great opportunity to kind of be introduced to the whole experience. But but yeah, that whole battery drain thing just, it, it escapes me how things like that, you know, leave quality assurance. And that's that's a thumbs up. I, how does that even process? I know. Do people not use their own products? I, I don't understand. It is weird. Like, I've had uh, issues on... On a couple, of, I don't, I don't have, I haven't really had any weird issues on my Note Two or my HTC One, but all of my previous Android devices, like, all, and I've had a few, have all had weird bugs that nobody really talks about. And then when you like dig around the XDA forums, you can see like people in the know are talking about it, right? But like nobody else is talking about. It. I was like, come on, isn't this kind of, isn't this kind of like something that people should be pissed off about? I would hope so. Yeah. I, w- I mean, good grief. Yeah, I think you're right. I think the press is giving them a huge pass. I think that uh, the end users are saying, well, you know, it's okay because Google's awesome. Or they're becoming like uh, Apple users. Yes, you know? yes, exactly. You know, and, and maybe, uh, and maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's a little, I don't know if it's more deserved in this case, maybe, but I mean, we're oh. sitting here with a Google Hangout going right now. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. Holy, so. yeah, yeah, holy, yeah. That, that, that kind of doesn't mix well, you know, where it's like, yeah, I, I get I get that. But at the same time, I have a high enough expectation for usability. I mean, didn't they go out and like hire Kevin Rose to do this stuff or something, right? I mean, wasn't he no, supposed he's to be doing VC visibility? crap. He's doing oh, VC crap. Oh, he's doing VC crap. I thought he was, I thought he's working for Google doing something. No, he is, yeah. He's doing VC, he, like Google has an arms, uh, hmm. Google, a Google Venture arm oh, okay where they okay. just go around giving money to people i suppose well he used to troll stuff for usability i'm just saying they need to cue him in and get something going because whatever's going on isn't working whoever's in charge of q a needs to be slapped um i'm just gonna put that out there. i kind of i kind of want a moto x though I, i'm a kind of <laughs> chat room i kind of want one though. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, we got an email into the show from Mike. And he said, first of all, congrats to you and Angela, the new member of the family. Thanks, Mike. I wanted to complain a little bit about what you're saying about Ubuntu since you started using Arch. I'm a okay. software developer and an Ubuntu user, and I use Ubuntu on my desktop without being a Linux expert. For mm-hmm. example, during the last episode of Last, you spent, and this has came in on uh, July 30th, so it's a little behind. Okay. Uh, for example, in the last episode of Last, you, spe- you specified Arch used systemd. I did not mm-hmm. know what that was before I had, and I, before you mentioned it, and I had to Google it. I know you sure. prefer Arch, but what are your but what are your uh, I know you prefer Arch, but you are an experienced Linux system admin and a Linux guy. For normal users, Ubuntu is a lot easier. I it was window it was a Windows user who occasionally dual booted with Windows and Fedora, OpenSUSE, mm-hmm. PC Linux OS, Ubuntu Mint, SUSE, and Ubuntu twelve oh four, and I'm not dual booting anymore. This is the OS I feel like can replace Windows for me, and I think it's smooth, user friendly. Uh, I watched Last Encoder Radio for some time now. And uh, when you took the Arch Challenge, I decided to try Arch 2, first in a VM, then do a booting alongside Ubuntu. And I also tried Integros and Manjaro, and they all bombed on him. So he's back on Ubuntu. Yeah, so a couple thoughts, and I'll try and run through these quickly. Uh, Ubuntu's awesome for those, you know, if it's working for you, just like with any Linux distro, if it's working for you, then that is the distro for you. That's a great choice. And I certainly run it for certain purposes and not for others. Uh, going back to the whole... Uh, Arch and Manjaro and some of these other things. Um, Arch is an advanced distribution for people that are power users in Linux. I mean, that really want to control every single aspect of it's their It's a experience. tinkers distro, It's a right? tinkers It's like distro. you're a car guy Super. and you like yep. to work on your car. And then Manjaro, of course, is, and they don't 
talk about this enough, but it is very much still in beta. So it's got some it's got some issues, and it's a rolling release. So a lot of times the, the headaches you're dealing with are fixed in an update. So that's something to put out there as well. That's one reason why I like uh, Arch or Manjaro over Ubuntu is that I don't have to cross my fingers every time I run the updater and hope it doesn't crap out on me because it does, and it <laughs> oh. has happened. Oh yeah. Um, so I know, haven't Ubuntu's been bit awesome, yet, but, although VirtualBox you know. has died on me twice now. After an update, but other than that, sure. and I was able to recover both times after slight consternation. Yep. Absolutely yeah. right. And so there's nothing wrong with running Ubuntu at all. I'm I'm actually Skyping in on Ubuntu right now. That doesn't mean it's my primary desktop. I, I use different things for everything. So we're not ripping on it in completion. We're simply saying its current direction scares the hell out of us. It scares the hell out of me anyway. He also so. mentions, though, by the way, that he's uh, landed on Unity. Mm, or, I'm sorry, yeah. uh, XFCE. Oh, XFC. That's yeah. a good. Okay, that's yeah. cool. He sort of. I love, yeah. yeah, yeah. That's interesting. All right. An email came in from Tom. He said, "Hi, Chris and Matt. It's good that you cover Linux features like Mint and Zorin OS that can help ease the transition of Windows users to Linux. However, I feel something is still missing with these reviews of Linux that the majority of Windows users are scared of not having: Windows-like okay. active security and visible security. The problem is that most Windows users are yeah. used to software firewalls that prompt them to allow deny permanent rules." Or, with, or every time they connect to the internet. On a standard Linux install, the firewall is off by default. Perhaps even not seeing an animated network firewall icon on the taskbar could put some off. Having antivirus software block a web page, for example, that has malicious code injected into it, not only protects the Windows user, but alerts them that the site is hijacked and could siphon their credentials. This is where I think Linux needs an antivirus, and the fact that Linux doesn't need an ar antivirus argument fails. Can you, Chris, Matt, and the chat room suggest how to overcome the issues of easy firewall, antivirus-like protection on the internet, and more visible security on Linux? I, of course, am interested in this as I dual boot, but I still find myself using Windows more than I'd like to. I mm -hmm. suspect others are in a similar situation. Sorry for that long email. Great show, and uh, thanks for reading all of that. Uh, two things. One, no argument from me. I think that Linux users are living in la-la land when it comes to uh, uh, to the belief that they're somehow protected from malware. That's absolute crap. Um, second, second thing, though, yes, there are absolutely uh, antiviruses that exist currently that do a fantastic job at dealing with uh, Windows viruses on your on your Linux box. And for those new things that crop up occasionally in the Linux space as far as viruses, you know, it'll take care of that as well. As far as having the alerts and stuff, I think that would be a great idea, but that would require either a corporation getting involved or a nonprofit or maybe some sort of crowdfunding environment to create something like that to happen. We just haven't come to critical mass yet to where that's going to take place. Mm. Um, the apps already, like at the under underlying level, exist, but it's the it's the bubbling the little bubbles and the alerts and the but, the okay. Fluidity, let me ask you this, you know? though, Matt. Don't you feel like this is maybe our opportunity to break clean of this environment of fear that companies like Norton and McAfee have sustained for years on the Windows platform to essentially manipulate Windows users into being scared to buy their insurance policies? Um. Yes and no. Well, no, not really. And here's why. And until we un. Okay, so the problem is, is that unless you're running something like Chrome or something that basically, you know, has, I mean, you're really sure you're not going to get infected with something. Even in Linux, if it executes code, there's that potential. Most people using a computer, especially coming from the Windows space, don't have any idea what they're doing. And so, you know, as far as having the alerts and stuff is concerned, a lot of people find that comforting, uh, even if it is a little delusional, much like UAC. You know, it's like, oh, that makes me feel more comfortable. Even though it's completely pointless, it does offer some comfort. Sadly, yes, some companies do take advantage of that. But I do think that security in Linux for casual users, non-IT people, is terrible. And I'm going to say that again. I think if you're a non-IT person that literally just jumped over from Windows, you are going to execute everything you can get your hands on because you don't know any differently. You don't know about where the packages are coming from, and you really do need something to ba basically babysit you because people aren't wired for that. They're just not. Yeah. Um, IT people are. Absolutely. IT people roll their eyes and think, God, you people are idiots. But the fact of the matter is, is I used to deal with people like this on a daily basis. Folks aren't wired for that. So they do need the option of a babysitter, but I don't think it should necessarily be enabled by default. I think when you s install a distro that it should prompt you, are you a newbie or are you advanced? And then your experience is then catered accordingly. That's all I would say. All right, let's uh, let's take it to the hangout. Let's get let's okay. give uh, uh, Chris there with the uh, epic beard uh, a chance to because uh, <laughs> he didn't have his mic working last time we went to him. Chris, is your mic working now? Oh no, hold on, still not, man. Two in a row. That's gonna be your last chance, man. That's your. <laughs> yeah, you gotta check that stuff with Paul Saudi somehow. It's all right. It's all right. Uh, it's all right. I, I anybody else on the hangout panel want to chime in? Do you think uh, Linux needs antivirus and visible security, more visible security alerts to the user? 
Anybody want to? And and it's a placebo. Could take it, Josh. Yeah, take it. <clears throat> I think it should have. Like I think Clam AV has its use, not mm. for viruses on Linux, though, but for scanning files that potentially have viruses that could be harmful to Windows, because that mm-hmm. still could island hop over to your Windows machines. Exactly. You know, say if you're a novice. So. Well, I remember we just saw we just talked about it yesterday on last. Uh, you have that uh, that malware that is not really interested in much on your Linux box other than what your web browser is doing, right? That's what it cares about more about what Chrome and Firefox are up to. Exactly. Um, Can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you, Chris. Awesome. So what do you think? Um, well, I think that uh, uh, if you want to have something you know visual to to give to a new user, you can have plenty of uh, web browser plugins, whether for Chrome or Firefox, that you can throw in there. That um, can things like NoScript or uh, AdBlock Plus that can give you a visual um, that uh, uh, can keep uh, uh, keep bad things from executing. Uh, within the browser, but I think that as far as a firewall or antivirus goes, I mean, you have your Clam AV and you have a couple of other options, but um, when it comes to the firewall, um, I think that's an opportunity to teach. It's an opportunity to introduce people um, that aren't familiar um, to teach them how it works and how to maintain it. Um, because, I mean, as much as you would like to, you can't sit grandma down with, with you know, any version <laughs> of Linux true. and expect her to That's true. know how everything works and, and expect it to be safe. I mean, you, you have to, to carry on from there and, and uh, give them the full experience and, and, uh, and teach them. Yeah, very good points. All right, so uh, I, I I tend to agree, and I more so from the fact that I, I think I'm on board with you guys in regards to uh, what users need to be comfortable and to kind of act as an educational experience. Um, in fact, uh, you know, we aren't the first people to touch on this, Matt. You remember Xandros. Oh, yeah. I, actually, I did a presentation, uh, Linux Fest 03, I believe, uh, on Xandros, talking about the fact that, and I and one of the analogies I used, is, you know, the screenshot you have up here, right, right, giving an example, is that they understand that just because you like to eat does not mean that you like to cook. They understand that just because you like to have your oil change does not mean that you want to sit there in the driveway with your monkey suit on and get under the car. Yeah, you're not. I'm one can. of those guys. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I. I'm like six six flavors of lazy. There's no way I have any interest in doing any of that. And I would pose the same thing to a computer. Um, so a lot of IT people have this belief that well, they just need to learn. Really, what are the things that you have that you pay to have someone do for you that you're not interested in learning? Translate that. That's the point of it. Is a lot of people want are willing and happy to pay for software or other tools to do that for them. Mm-hmm. Stepping outside of that bubble for a minute, I would say this is an opportunity to start promoting boxes that sit outside of the computer attached to your router that, that then run this stuff for you. So that it is, you know, out of the box easy. They don't have to worry about it and it's secure. So that's another option as well. But no, people don't want to learn this stuff. I, I can't tell you how many times that I hear that. And it's just like it's you know, it's it's a novelty thought. I think even young people, um, young people know how to run smartphones. They know how to run Angry Birds. They know how to play games. They don't give a flying crap about a lot of this stuff unless they are, in fact, geeks or they are, in fact, interested in this stuff. A lot of them aren't, though. You'd be surprised. Um, Good point. Good point. Sad. Sad, but no, it's true. Yeah. yeah. No, it is. No, actually, you know, I mean, to us, it seems foreign and strange, but these people have other things in their lives that they're more interested in. Mm-hmm. And I, I can't hold I can't hold that against them. Yeah. I deal with them every day, and some of these people are really smart individuals. That's what's you know. A lot of people. That's how a lot of us make money. <laughs> is by dealing yeah, with right, these people. Exactly. <laughs> totally. Totally. Yeah. And it's and it's and it is wasteful and it is silly, but it's true. Yeah. Um. I just uh, I worry about future generations not learning. Uh, but look, here's something else that I worry about. And our next sponsor is going to help you solve a problem that is becoming more and more of a concern for a lot of us with a lot of the recent NSA revelations going on. ProXPN. Go to ProXPN.com. You know what they are? They are what I think is becoming one of the up-and-coming premier VPN solution providers. They got all types of VPNs, great VPNs, uh, and they also use OpenVPN, which obviously I'm a huge fan of. Uh, so if you haven't thought about why you might want a VPN, obviously the first is to kind of protect your identity online. And the other would be to keep what you're doing private. Um, even though you might be VPNing to somewhere else, it might eventually get uh, monitored. It's at least one step removed. But the other thing you can That's use right. it for is to put yourself physically in another location. So maybe if you need to be over across the pond, either side of that pond, ProXPN can help you do that. And we've got a great deal for ProXPN. When you go to ProXPN.com and you decide to buy, 
you can take 20% off the lifetime of your purchase. And, you know, I think their base rate's only like seven bucks a month. It's super it's crazy cheap. cheap. Yeah. 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 Uh, and uh, with Pro XPN, you're going to get uh, unlimited anonymous IP addresses. You can have PPT connectivity. You can have open VPN connectivity. They've got support for mobile devices, they've got customer support. Unlimited data transfer, great speeds. I've been playing with it. I'm pretty dang impressed. And they also have a nice control panel. And you can just set this right up in Network Manager and then connect from your Linux box. It's really, really sweet. So go to proxpn.com. Use the code JBLive when you check out. JBLive will get you 20% off of that plan for like ever. They, and they have a really good Linux tutorial, actually, for folks that are uh, coming to it from the Linux desktop. It's uh, worth checking out. They've got uh, server locations in Singapore, mm-hmm. London, Seattle, Dallas, Los Angeles, New York, and Amsterdam. And uh, they uh, they have uh, two tw- uh, they have five five hundred twelve bit uh, encrypted tunnels and their encryption key is a twenty forty eight bit encryption key, so pretty good stuff. Go to proxpn.com and use the code JBLive when you check out to get twenty percent for life. Nice. We've had a lot of people asking us about VPNs, and that's how I would do it. So I thought, hey, if this is how I'm going to do it, these guys should be a sponsor. That's right. Andre writes and he says on OMG Ubuntu, there's an article about the. Android touch uh, Android lock screen getting an official quote unquote not official at all um, uh, Ubuntu touch lock screen where you can replace the lock screen on your Android device with the Ubuntu touch and of course this is stirring up some controversy it was done by a developer over on the XDA forums and uh, I'm looking at a picture of it right now and it it looks like all the promo images you've seen of Ubuntu touch running on Android that clock with the uh, oh, with the yeah. dots going around right yeah um and so he's asking, uh, we, you know, wh- what do we think about this kind of thing? Is this uh, is this hurting Canonical? Is this evil to rip off a, a, a Linux company like this, or is this just uh, part of the uh, part of the way the web works now? I think it remains to be seen. I really do. I, I'm still kind of on the fence about it. Uh, lately, the, the the company as a whole has me just scratching my head as to what they're thinking. So, well, no, this isn't I, Canonical. Did the deport? They did the port. Some other guys oh, took it and oh. said, "I like the look of it. I'm going to make a port of it and kind of ripped off their oh. branding a little bit." Oh, no, that's naughty. No, no, that's not good. That's yeah. not good at all. That's yeah. not all right. Yeah. Nope. That's, that's kind of where I fell down, too. I mean, I like it. I, I mm-hmm. have it. I'm not going to lie. I did have it on my Nexus 7. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> hey, you know, you got to try it. But right? that's just that's because nice. I'm just waiting for Ubuntu Touch to finish. Uh, exactly. Right. Deval writes and he says, hello, Chris and Matt. I've been listening to the show for a while now. I've grown to be quite a fan of it. I would just like to say thank you for providing such a great, amazing content day after week. And week after week, I don't know how you do it, to be honest. Well, thanks, Deval. Um, I do it by not pronouncing names correctly. I don't spend any That's time. Right. Yeah. I would like to add that my dad finally runs Linux, thanks to you guys, his ancient one gigabyte, one, one gigabytes of RAM, one dot, 1.6 gigahertz Core 2 Duo finally got messed up enough that he couldn't connect to the internet anymore. So he finally agreed to let me put Linux on it. Now I have an option as the choice of distro. But since this is my dad and it was an old laptop, I decided to give Linux Mint 15 a try, thanks to your review of it on the show. And it looks gorgeous. It looks absolutely spectacular, and my father was completely blown away by it. Now I don't have to worry about him installing some malware toolbar.exe or anything like that on his machine. But wait, there's more. My sister came to me with a strange request the same day, wanting to extract a couple of clips from a video. At first, I didn't think I had any choice, and I thought I'd have to use Windows Movie Maker. Then I remembered you guys talking about OpenShot. I quickly downloaded onto my sister's laptop, extracted the clips she needed uh, through X11 VNC, because she asked me to do it on her computer and I wasn't there. Can't thank you guys enough for introducing me to OpenShot and more. Keep up the great show, and congratulations on the baby, Chris. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, you know, and throw some splash top on that, and uh, you can do it from the comfort of your own home. Yeah, now that's, you know, splash top might be fast enough you could actually video edit. Oh, you could. I, I've actually done it. Yeah, you totally can. Yeah, that was, uh, I linked in the show notes, there was an article that Pharonix ran that was, like, they did some sort of test, and they were saying, like, splash top in some cases was, I don't know how this is possible. Actually, now that I think about it, but I think it was saying 10 times faster than VNC. I, based on my experiences, I can't assign a numeric value to it, but it is it it, it was painfully faster than VNC. I'll, I'll <laughs> I won't assign numbers to it, but it was v, VNC. And then going back to VNC or even TeamViewer or any of the others, it was it was there was definitely a difference. But VNC just it's horrible to use VNC after using a uh, splash top. It's just horrible. Ugh. I don't know. Ugh. I don't know. I feel I, dirty. I don't know. Hey Matt, do you have any experience with BT Guard? Isn't that oh, isn't BitTorrent that for, Guard? Uh, BitTorrent? No. Yeah, don't. That, uh, yeah, don't don't. That's do not that. a VPN um, solution. That's that's. It for, is well. Isn't that for it, just making it, sure you don't uh, VPN yeah, from the wrong? P- it was or, something I mean, that worked really torrent. well for about a year. 
Um, no, it's not something that is really considered to be a secure. It's a little bit kind of the – they're dealing with some of the uh, – yeah, I would avoid it personally. I, I haven't had good experiences uh, that I've heard about it, but I've not used it personally, so yeah. I can't speak. But yeah, I wouldn't. Uh, Google around about B, uh, BT Guard problems, B, BT Guard security, and then come to your own conclusion. So uh, Hangout, I want to toss to you guys real quick. Anybody in there uh, play with Splashtop or any other remote desktop solutions that you think are worth people checking yeah. out? Anybody had any experience with those? No, everybody's shaking their head no. Oh, well, man. all right. Let's check that out. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought Splashtop was pretty great. Oh, you, yeah. It, it'll change the way you use your computer. You will literally, like, all the stuff that you need to have your, just, you know, when you're doing just, like, mild mouse access for that you have to come upstairs to do or go to another room to do? You'll be doing this from your recliner from now on, I'm telling you. Absolutely. And, yes, TeamViewer is also a really good one, but I found that the performance is a wee bit better with the Splash Tub. So. All right, Garrett writes in. He says, hi, Chris and Matt. Long veer of the show. I try to catch it every episode. Congrats on the new kid. I've heard you say you do all your editing on the Bonobo. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would hope that means under Linux, he says. If it is, what programs do you use for editing? I've been unable to find many good programs for video editing under Linux. So, Gary, you have some back episodes to go catch up on, my friend. Uh, I do the – I could edit audio on the Bonobo. I can do the soundboard. From the Bonobo, so like if uh, if we were sitting around here and uh, all of a sudden um, I decided like uh, oh crap you know uh, I th- hey I think that's Anderson Cooper oh my gosh it's Anderson <laughs> Cooper everybody <laughs> something like that is driven from a Linux box uh, right now in the studio but the video editing is hap- is happening on on the final cut on the on the Apple's final cut I I was thinking though possibly about this show might be our first mm. regular show that I edit fully. Under the uh, GNU slash Linux. Wow. I don't know. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, I don't right? know. I mean, OpenShot, I guess, would probably be the way to go. Um, Yes, I'd say OpenShot's good, although KDE, well, it depends on what you're really doing as far as transitions and stuff. Um, Yes, I'm going to say OpenShot probably is an option, but you might want to try the uh, K, uh, KDN Live. Go, go that route for especially running a KDE. Whoa, desktop. Fox News alert. <laughs> <laughs> that comes ah, in nice. with KDN Live. I had yes. that was for the chat room. All right, Chris. Yeah. Uh, here, this one comes from Cody. Hi uh, there, uh, Chris and Matt. Great show. Been watching since uh, shortly before Brian left, and boy, has it gotten good. Anyway, I was wondering if I could get your input on something. I have a Raspberry Pi set up in my house as a combined NAS and DLNA media server with one terabyte of external hard drive attached via USB. I'm looking to r- restrict the NAS port to uh, where only I ha- uh, to okay. I'm looking to restrict the NAS port only I had to select other few people could access it from Windows and access it at the same time. As I'm the only Linux user in the house, so which is easier to set up a kind of Raspbian, ITS, or some? Boy, this is getting clunky. But what I think uh-huh. he's saying is he wants to set up a NAS server and only give certain people access. Um, and he says, congrats on the baby. <laughs> uh, so, uh, C. Smith, Cody, what, here's what I would say. Uh, yeah, so he asked if Samba would be the right way to go. If you've got Raspbian already loaded on your Raspberry Pi, then you can start Samba, and then there is a command called SMB password, and you oh, do yes. SMB password dash E, and then the Linux user that you want to have access, and you could just enable just those users. So you could enable your account and your buddy's account, but not the other people's account in your house. Right? Stuff. Good stuff. Lazarus asked, whatever happened to Lightworks? Uh, it's, well, first of all, I can't get it running on Arch. Yeah, it it's still so long out, and I, uh, <laughs> I, I'm you know honestly I'm holding out for what OpenShot plans on doing over time. I think that's probably in the in the long stretch is probably where it's going to come out winning. Um, although Caden Live's been kind of my go-to thing here lately, just because it does have more, it has uh, additional functions that are useful to me. Oh yeah. But, uh, you know, but OpenShot's really cool if you want the Blender functionality, things like that. But I think long term, I think OpenShot will be the winner as they begin plugging in all the work that he's been putting yeah, into it. Yeah, man, that's what I was thinking. It's yeah. like, might as well get on board with that now. Yep. Uh, although, I'll be honest, the one advantage that Lightworks, I, th- I don't know if OpenShot does this. It depends on if it just uses FFmpeg, but um, I record stuff in that crazy ass ProRes format. And we'll see, and that's all this stuff is, and maybe this too. I'm not sure about that specifically, but all this stuff as it, as they he's completely retooling OpenShot. I mean, like totally from the ground up. Everything, yeah, everything's different. And yeah. so as that becomes to come about, yeah, in fact, I he's think trying I re- to make it more pro level. I think know? I think I'm trying to find his uh, Kickstarter page right now, but I don't see. I think I remember him saying he just did an update on his uh, Facebook page. I don't know if it's uh, yeah, he's sending out all the goodies. I think now. I remember they are working on that. So uh, that would be that would be interesting. Um, all right, so we got, uh, I think this will be our last email at the point there's still, um, let's see, if I tab over to the Linux box, how, how do I, how do you, you, Thunderbird doesn't, oh yeah, here we go, 100, there's still 189 unread 
<laughs> emails. Wow. And I didn't even open up BitMessage. I've been, I've been replying to BitMessages this morning. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, uh, speaking of that, that fits in well with our next email uh, from Sam. He says, uh, hi, Chris and Matt. In one of your shows, Chris said that he doesn't watch much television anymore. Instead, he subscribes to podcasts. I like the idea since I don't watch television either. So I started looking for interesting podcasts, not necessarily Linux specific. But I really didn't find anything worth listening to. So would Chris mind sharing a list of the podcasts with us? That's a great idea. This this floats around a lot for me because I'm I, I browse around to see what other folks have up their sleeves. Um, but that's where uh, one. So I'll start with one podcast that I listen to every every Sunday after Lass. Um, after Lass is done, after it's published, after mm-hmm. I've put the family to bed, I break out a beer and I listen to a little No Agenda with Adam Curry and John C. Dvorak. Um, and uh, they, Adam Curry, was experimenting with BitMessage this morning. So I've been corresponding with Adam Curry this morning over BitMessage, which was fun. And uh, he's, you know, he's got an interest in it. And so it was, it's cool to work with people as they try out BitMessage for the first time. So mm-hmm. No Agenda is on my list of one of my regulars. And another podcast that I listen to every single week, otherwise I just jump around a lot, uh, is Mission Log, a Roddenberry Star Trek podcast where uh, they're going in chronological air date of the Star nice. Trek shows, starting with the original series, working all the way up to uh, the uh, end of Enterprise. And uh, they just did uh, an episode 53, The Ultimate Computer, where M5... Um, did, oh, yes, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. M5 comes on board, and they, they plug in M5, and he takes over the Enterprise, and and then chaos ensues. Uh, so I, I really enjoy that podcast. So that's one I listen to regularly, but I really... those. There's another one I listen to on occasion uh, this week in Trek. Um, you can tell I've kind of been in a Star Trek kick lately. I'll also, <laughs> I'll also occasionally listen to This American Life uh, and Radio Lab, but not too often. Um, and then otherwise, I just kind of shop. What about you, Matt? Do you have any podcasts you listen to um, on a regular not basis? Not really so much anymore. I used to listen to a lot of the uh, some of the Twi- uh, Twit Network stuff, you know, off and on. Oh, uh, yeah. I yeah, listen, I'll tune into know. their live streams sometimes. Yep. Sure. Yep. Um, I, I'm a buddy of uh, Lamar Wilson, so I, of course, listened to all his stuff, and or actually v- rather view it. And uh, so I watched that. Um, that's really, you know, I don't watch uh, as many podcasts as I used to. I'm just, you know, so caught up in my usual day to day stuff. So I'm either out doing something or I'm, or I'm watching. Uh, you I got caught with the Netflix, stuff, you know? you the Netflix plague. I understand. You got the Netflix plague. Yeah, I got the ne- <laughs> I got Plex. What do you want? <laughs> I know, right? How great has Plex been? Plex has really been awesome. Yeah. You yeah. Know, yeah. Yeah. So I've been I've been catching a lot of pretty some some pretty good shows. So. Uh, I I think out of um all of the sort of you know a lot of the stuff we do in these segments are like Chris is solving a problem in his house and now he's going to talk about it or Chris solved a problem right. for a client now he's going to I mean that's honestly where like a lot of the topics come from. True. Oh, and it is. Plex was like oh man, I I want to just like. I, I, I just want to do a whole Plex show. I love Plex so yeah. much these days. I've even I even uh, got uh, I even signed up and bought a lifetime membership of my Plex. And I originally when I said I was like, ah, I'm not going to buy that. I'm just going to use the freebie. But then you know, I was out. I had the uh, HTC One has fantastic freaking speakers on it, and mm-hmm. I was like, gosh, you know, we're going to Costco. We're going to be sitting in the truck while we wait for something to get delivered. I've got 30 minutes to kill with my kids. My Plex bah, 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 pulled up one of their favorite little shows. And, you know, perfectly viewable, perfectly watchable from the HTC One right there while we're sitting in the Costco parking lot. Oh, that's awesome. And I was like, that's okay. Awesome. Yeah. And, you know, I'm sure I could do that from Netflix, but this is my collection. Exactly. Because, I mean, that, I'm in the same boat, and, and that's exactly what I do. I mean, I have uh, a lot of stuff on Vudu that, you know, basically the where you buy a DVD or Blu-ray, and it comes with a little slip, and you put it on the, uh, you know, put it on your Vudu setup. Um, I've got that. I got the Netflix. I got the Hulu. But, yeah, I find myself using Plex more and more simply because it's DVDs and Blu-rays that I've backed up. So this is content that I'm excited about, and uh, not Netflix. Yeah, exactly. And, and the quality is a little better. Way and, better. And the other thing that has happened to me I've been bitten by is uh, – is that age-old problem where A, doesn't work under Linux natively, and B, they pull content off of there from time to time, and then uh, you're kind of left off. Oh, shoot. 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 Crap. Shoot. Crap. There's Uh-oh. one more topic I want to talk about before we go. I shouldn't have waited this long, Matt. <sighs> oh, oh, dang it. So you and I asked during the live stream last week. Let's just ask the Hangout panel right now. Just curious. Anybody on the okay. Hangout, just say I, if you are considering rolling your own mail server. Oh yes, all right. Aye. Got one. Aye. Two. Aye. All right. There's two, and so two of two out of the out of the group of you. I don't know how many. What is there? Eight people on top. Five people. Um. So when we asked in the IRC chat room, chat room, look at all these eyes in the IRC right now, right? Look at all these. Oh yeah. Look at all aye, these. Aye, aye. So when we asked last week, 
Because last week, Lava Bit shut down. Um, Tormail was shut down. Secure Circle shut down. Okay, in like a two-week time span, the private email industry, all the top dogs have just basically left the market. And I, I got thinking about the fact that when you're on a Google Mail, a Hotmail, whatever it is, you have no idea who's asking for what, when it gets, ha- when it happens. Exactly. You don't know if you get swept up in some sort of mass surveillance, like what happens with the Verizon and other telco uh, phone metadata uh, monitoring. And if you host your own email server in your house or on your own private locked up VPS, at least they have to come to you, and they have to say, "We want access to your email, Mr. Fisher." And, and they have no to serve me a warrant. A convenience for them, really. It's right. It's not something where eventually the companies are going to build in these automated extraction processes to save them time and money. It's not something where they can just put a tap right in front of my house and monitor. Uh, yeah, well, maybe. And it's one of these things where at least I would have some sort of visibility, even if I can't prevent it from happening. Even if there's no legal recourse, I at least am aware of when it happens. And so th- these things got me thinking. And so I set up a mail server using some open source software from my grandparents recently. It was from part of my grandpa's birthday. I got him a dot com using our last 249 code. And then I, uh, our Linux 249. And then I forwarded that to a, uh, to a, their own personal mail server that, that I said I pre-set up for them on that Nexus 7. So they just push a little mail button on the Nexus 7 and it launches into their private mail account. Um, and because they were on MSN for years since MSN was a dial-up service back in the day when it competed with AOL. I, I said, okay, like, grandma, grandpa, let's get you off MSN. Let's get you on, you know, and I, we have a good in-family joke URL that we use that everybody thought was really great and right. had a good laugh at. And I, I set all this up and I thought, yeah, maybe I should do this for myself. I'm getting emails from people outside the United States all the time. Who knows what the hell they want to talk to me about? Who knows what the hell's going to be in that email? Who knows what list they might be on when I'm responding back to them? And so I've been thinking about this a little bit, but I don't like the idea of having a mail server in my house. It's a pain in the ass. Oh, yeah. It doesn't, it doesn't at least at first pass, it doesn't seem very practical. I mean, when you first think about it. Here's what I think. Here's, what, here's the sort of like thing that gnaws at me, is it's one of those things where it's hard to quantify a reason to do it today fully. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, man, maybe the NSA is going to monitor my shit, but I don't care. I'm not saying anything. I don't care. It's not like I'm all that important. Right. But the reality, it, to me, seems like so. There was this. Now we're getting down to the conspiracy range. But the, uh, there was this story that ran this week that the NSA plans to reduce their system administration staff by ninety percent and automate the majority of the uh, task automation. That seems obvious. Of course, that's going to happen, right? Sure. Absolutely. And so, so they do this task automation. They're gonna they're gonna automate all of this data analysis, and pretty soon it's just going to be computers looking at this stuff, indexing, storing information, and it's going to be every now and then a one's going to go in this database for, for so. Matt likes cats. Well, let's put a one in that. Put a put a one in that field. All right. Matt likes burgers. Put a one in that field. And over twenty years, they're going to have all of this information about you that you have no say in opting out of that system. And exactly. You get all of the, you're going to have all of these weird things that will happen. You'll have profiling that happens. You'll have analysis that happens. You'll have assumptions that are made based on you contributing twenty, thirty, whatever it's going to be years, ten years of information into the system. And at that point, when that arrives, you'll look back and go, "Well, shit." Maybe I should have done something about that back early when I found out about this shit was going on. I knew it was a bad idea all along. I knew this was going to happen, but I never did anything, and now it's too late. And to quantify this, and for people that are thinking, oh my gosh, this sounds like unfiltered stuff, because I understand that at first pass it doesn't. Let me put this into something we all experience. Junk mail, mailing lists, and catalogs for really weird stuff. Okay, This is an example of being thrown into that kind of bucket on a very... But you know, platonic, uh, casual you know scale. Uh, don't try to appease the if people are saying this unfiltered yeah. stuff are just morons that aren't appreciating the situation of the, that we're in. And well, you I'm know not what? trying to appease them. And I'm trying to is, help people process this that. This is like one of those things we're not that wired to. Yeah, open we're not source wired to think that way. Linux software. It's here to help us with all of this. Let's yeah. not let's not hide from it. Let's embrace the fact that this is a new calling for open source software. This is a new need that open source software can solve. And I think we should embrace that fact. I think it's worth ce- and it's celebrating that aspect of it. That thankfully we've all been sitting here championing a platform and a methodology and a theology that in the long run is going to protect us from an oppressive government, at least at the technological level. And I don't think we should shy away from that. I don't, it's stupid. It it it's it demeans. It's it's reductive of the overall issue to say, oh, well, who that's unfiltered related. Ah, come on, screw those guys. Well, I'm not even trying to appease them. A lot of times when people feel that way. It's a defensive mechanism because we're taught to not question things. That's and if true. We want to get we want to get more people to 
to you know actually rationally think about things it's not about appeasing them it's helping them to see something in a new way yeah um you know maybe it's like someone trying linux for the first time well i've heard that's stupid because i heard it was this and i heard it with that but by getting them to actually quantify it something they can relate to it's like oh well, okay well that makes sense to me so by using that catalog example that is an example of how that oh, yeah. does happen I transferring see what you're back over factually it will happen you will end up in a list that you don't want to be on that's that's reality when you when this all this servers harvesting garbage goes on it will happen next thing you know you're going to be on a list for i like to uh you know explode cats or something because you looked up you know uh, explode <laughs> you have explosive diarrhea on one what list was i and you have and you love cats on the other and that gets intermixed things happen there was something i was looking for just last week for unfiltered right. and um I, uh, I I I uh, I I opened up the tab and of course you know right. in Chrome you just start you just start typing and it it starts Google and I started typing out and I said this is a DuckDuckGo search and it was like um I don't know I don't remember what it was but it was like one of those things where I was like I don't really want to log of this right. you, know, you know what's funny to show you why the system and there's so if you remove all conspiracy from it. Sure. You're just going to have a system that just doesn't work anyways. Like, I'll give you an example right now. If I pull out my HTC One and I look at my Google Now screen, yeah. Google Now is giving me driving directions to the nearest Walmart. I, Matt, wow. I, I don't go to Walmart. But during Coda Radio today, Michael said the phrase Walmartification. And I Google searched, <laughs> I Google searched Walmartification just to get the spelling of it because I, I thought it would be a great title suggestion. Because I Google searched Walmartification, apparently Google now thinks I'm a Walmart shopper and is preventing me or is presenting me a Google Now card with driving directions to the nearest Walmarts. And this is just I don't want to be in the system as a Walmart <laughs> user. <laughs> I forget the video. There was a really awesome video that talked about the danger of Google having some of the power that it does. And it was a guy that was calling up to check on the status of something he'd ordered. And it was I think it was like a new pair of pants or something. And he's like, well, according to our records, you know, you've been to the doctor recently because of your blood pressure. And, oh, you, you, your weight's kind of right. going up there. We need to look into that. Oh, no, he's ordering a pizza. That's what it was. He was yeah, ordering a yeah. pizza. And it went through his medical history and all this other stuff because it was just readily available. You know, that kind of environment, that kind of world isn't really that unlikely to be that far off. And it's yeah. kind of scary scary yeah. that's not tin foil hat stuff stuff we deal with now 10 15 years ago hell 20 years ago was totally tin foil where here we are you know so that's kind of how i see it i would leave you with this final thought too is like yeah. if you like the ability of running your own email server if you like the idea of having your own file server mm -hmm. if you like that then it is worth being a, a user of that just to encourage those developers to continue on it's a cool skill to learn. It's cool, and it's kind of neat to be able to set it up for people. You know. Yeah. That, yeah. You know. I, I mean. So uh, I think I might. I, I think I might cover how I set up that mail system for them because I used a really cool open source package that I think a lot of people could use to get going. I did it like it, I did it in an afternoon. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. So I think it worked out pretty well. So uh, I, this is a point of uh, This is a, maybe a topic I'd like to get more feedback from you guys out sure. there on is how you've rolled your own mail service. So email us Linux Action Show at JupiterBroadcasting dot com. Of course. Love to hear all of your feedback out there. You can join us Monday afternoons for Linux Action Show Unplugged. And hang. I think also, this is a long shot. If anybody out there has a Mumble server and like to help us get that up and running, I don't know anything about Mumble, really. I mean, I know what Mumble is, but I've never set up a Mumble server. Um, I don't really want to. I don't know if I want to use a Mumble host or which one's good. So if you have an experience out there, or if you run a Mumble server and want to help the community out, uh, get in touch with us. Just email me uh, or uh, the show, Chris at Jupiter Broadcasting. Dot com and Linux Action Show at JupiterBroadcasting.com. Yeah. I wanted to uh, give a special plug. I I'll put the link in the chat room right now. Professor oh. Messer? Professor Messer. I think is how you say his last name. It's a YouTube okay. channel. Yeah, I know. Uh, and he, it, it, it's one I stumbled across this weekend when prepping for last, and I thought I'd just uh, give people it's. Um, he's got, he just lo uploaded a couple of CompTIA Linux Plus uh, uh, tutorials. Uh, um, uh, Linux Plus, uh, Common Bootloader Commands, uh, Linux Device Drivers, Linux Hardware Resources. Um, he's got he's got like it's it's for getting your CompTIA Linux Plus exam, and he's got videos that go through those uh, those sections of the LX uh, LX one hundred one and LX one hundred one L L I L P I C one and one dot one. It's anyways. If you if you're looking at the Linux Plus exams or you're curious about the material they cover. Uh, his YouTube channel not only has those, but lots of other good stuff in there. He's got uh, A plus hardware information in there. He's got Network Plus uh, video groups in there and study group uh, sessions in there. I I think he is a uh, a college professor himself or some somebody in that degree who covers this stuff. And I thought it was just an interesting resource. And it's as current as of two days ago with some of this stuff. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Professor Messer 
is the Professor uh, M E S Professor M E S S E R is the uh, channel on YouTube. It might be a little good extra reading if you guys are looking for something uh, afterwards. Uh, hang out, guys. Thanks for joining us. Anybody want yeah. anything to touch on before we go? Last chance, hang out. I'm right. done. All right, Don. Well, thanks for joining us. It was good to see you. I'll see you again. All right, very good. Uh, Chris, uh, wonderful beard, and Josh, uh, thanks for chatting with us, guys. It was good to see from you and everybody else who didn't speak up. Thanks for joining us, you guys. You're Definitely. a good panel. Right, I'm going to hang up on you guys now. There you go. <laughs> All right, Matt. Well, I think that'll wrap up uh, the first episode cool. of Last Unplugged. Still in, still in beta. We'll be working out the format. So, of course, really, any 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 input you guys have and things you want to see from the show, just let us know. We're we're it's very early in the massaging process. Lots of lots of possibilities still, and we'd love to get more of your input, especially. As, as we get like to a mumble server or something like that, you guys can join us regularly and hang out in there and talk with us. So I think that'll be a lot of fun. Don't forget, we want your feedback. Linux Action Show at jupiterbroadcasting.com. Or if you use that contact link at the top of our site, just for you guys, just for this show. Well, really, everybody gets it now. But I did it because of the show. I added the subject line. Huh? Subject nice. line, Matt. How about that? Nice. I like it. I like the format. I think it's going to work out really well. Absolutely. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. We'll see you on Sunday for the big show. See you back here next Monday. <laughs>